Hello, everyone. So, uh, did you enjoy the film? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe the best yes after a film I've ever heard. Um, so, uh, welcome back, John Borden. Thank you very much. Um, so, we saw a little bit of it uh, just at the beginning of this film, and you mentioned it earlier, but it, maybe it'd be interesting just to talk about how your earlier film, Hope and Glory, came about. Like, how, what was the origins of that film, and how did you start to make it? Well, it, it, it was very—it was an indelible experience of being in the the Blitz and the war. And I was I was seven when the war started, and twelve when it ended. And so, um, this was eighteen. So that was eight, about eight years later. Um, and it's, well, I just <clears throat> I just had such vivid. Um, indelible memories of that period that um, I, uh, I, I I just you know thought, thought it would be a good idea to make it um, and uh, it was also <clears throat> about um, my family uh, my sister and you know it's curious thing <clears throat> that my sister at the end of Hope and Glory she gives birth to a baby and she marries the Canadian soldier who's fathered the child, and she goes off to Canada with the baby. And um, it's a year before <clears throat> her then husband was able to go back and join her. And in the in that year, it turned out that she had another baby. Obviously. Uh, not her husband's, because he was uh, 6,000 miles away. Um, so, um, and just a couple of years ago, I got a call from, from uh, Montreal, and this, this baby, uh, who's now a man you know, in his 60s, um, tra tracked me down. And so this came to light, and it was, I was astonished, you know. And, and, and I said, well, you know, he was looking for his mother. And I said, well, unfortunately, you've missed her by two years. She, she died. But I said, if you, know what, if you want to know what she was like, rent hope and glory. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he did, and, he, and then he subsequently came to see, to see all, the, all the family and uh, so forth. And then um, he uh, li lives in Maine. So when I went to New York to open this picture, and I called him up and I said, if you want to know what your mother was like when she came back from Canada, <laughs> Come and see the movie, <laughs> which he did. I mean, that's very, it's, from everything I've heard, especially with Hope and Glory, but for this one as well, it seems like it's really very, very close to your own life. I mean, are there, are there much differences, and is it, is it difficult to put, apply a dramatic structure to, to real events? Well, when I wrote the script, I, I, I showed it to my mother and to my older sister to see, and I said, look, if there's anything there you don't want me to show, you know, tell me and I'll change it. And um, they thought about it a lot and eventually they both agreed that we, it should be the way I had it. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things, <clears throat> you know, when I was writing it, I started off by just putting down all the vivid part memories I could remember and put them in order, some sort of order. And then I started to dramatize it a bit. <clears throat> and um, what my mother and my sister were astonished about was that things I thought I'd imagined had actually taken place, you know. And they could, how could I have observed these particular sexual exploits? Um, and so, you know, the relationship between memory and imagination is a very mysterious one. I mean, if you tell a story, just to just tell a story about how something that happened to you, um, you're employing imagination to a memory. And that, I'm, I'm fascinated about that, really, how that functions. And, <clears throat> and, the, and I did the same thing with the film you've just seen. The things I remembered, and uh, and and then putting them in 
some sort of order and 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 try, trying to evoke that period. That was the thing that pleased me more, perhaps, than anything was that I somehow managed to um, evoke England in the 50s. It was a kind of bleak time, but it was also it was also a turning point because. As you know, as you see expressed in the film, and it's not uh, overt, but it's implied, is that the older soldiers are still hanging on to the idea of empire and imperial Britain, and the younger ones, we could all see that it was all over, you know, and that this empire, the greatest empire ever in the world, um, was going to disappear. And it did. In a matter of a few years, it was all over. And England, from being having this great empire, or Britain having this great empire, uh, Britain became this small island off the coast of Europe. Um, but the other big thing that happened <clears throat> with the when the Labour Party came into power after the war is they did two great things. One was to start the National Health Service, which of course we can no longer afford. Um, and um, the other one was to start the secondary modern schools. Because up until that point, at the age of 11, you either went to grammar school and learned Latin, or you went to a craft school. You learned uh, metalwork or something. And out of that, those secondary modern schools, Every, where everyone was taught something of music and art and so forth. You project that forward to 1960, and all those kids became the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. And that's, that was the most transforming thing um, that happened to Britain, I think, in that, at that time. It's interesting you're saying about um, uh, you're interested in the imagination, but you also your characters. I mean, I know this one is specifically based on you, but like I was noticing there's sometimes a thread. I was watching The Tale of Panama the other day, and that's a character who invents the world the way he wants it to be. And is that something you're kind of conscious of that you're finding these threads in your own films? Or? Well, of course, you know, <clears throat> in making films is. Um, it's um, so much better to order the world the way you'd like it to be rather than have to put up with it the way it actually is. <laughs> Um, so when, when uh, just, to, just going back a little bit, when Hope and Glory came out, it did, I, I think, by any reasonable standards, pretty well. I mean, it was nominated for the for the Oscar, and uh, you know, it was a big financial success. How? Um, I mean, that must be strange in itself, just you know, seeing your own personal life, you know, at the Academy Awards. But um, uh, how soon did you have the inkling that you might make a follow-up film? Was that immediate? Well, I had that at the time, and um, I wanted to do this, um, but um, in a way. It seemed much better to have done it now rather than then, because now it has a kind of historical resonance. Um, whereas at the time, I feel that at the time, you're too close to the events somehow. Yeah. And the timing is, is everything with film. You know, if you, if how often do we watch a film like 10 years after we first saw it and we, how, we, how much we loved it at the time and we see it again when we're disappointed. And it's not to do, it's not that we've changed, it's really that the zeitgeist has changed. You know, when a film works and touches something in the world, it touches a nerve and it people respond to it and it works. If it's if the timing's out, um, it doesn't matter how good the film is, it won't uh, ring bells in the same way. And so there's an awful lot of luck involved in when you bring a film out and how it's received, I think. And was this a film that uh, was, it took a long time to, to, I mean, was it written a long time before you made it? Was, how, did that, how did that work? No. It wasn't. I, I I made notes, and I've always I've kept um, journals since I was sixteen. I piles them. I never never read them back. But in this case, I did. I went back and read the journals that I wrote when I was in the army, 
and uh, and of course that was a great help, particularly in the detail. But the fundamental stories in the film you've just seen all occur. The characters were all based very closely on the people I met and knew at that, at that time. And uh, so, you know, I fell in love with the wrong girl. And this, you know, at that time, the idea that a lower middle class boy could have a relationship with an aristocratic girl was really impossible. It was absolutely impossible. The class system was so strong at that time um, that it just wasn't feasible. And so I went through all that pain. <laughs> and, uh, and, all, and the character, for instance, I think the most poignant character in the film perhaps is the um, Sergeant Major Bradley who the, the, the stickler for lives by the letter of the law um, he was, and he was very much like that and, and it, it only emerged later on for me that you know that was how he was holding himself together by this rigid a uh, system of rules which stopped him from falling apart. And was it in sort of thinking about this film that made you rethink the, the, in that person and, and the events of the past? Does it does it make it, does it change your opinion of what's happened? Or well, you know, I when I it's very much as on on the you know I did feel. I kind of guilty because we plotted to overthrow him, and I went, I went, went, went to see him, and uh, he was, he didn't want to see me, uh, and I didn't realise at the time um, quite how what it, what had caused it. I mean, I, 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 I was told, but I, I didn't really sink in until um, much later. And when you, I mean, it's interesting. And when you, you've 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 been through it, you've looked through your past, and you, you put it into into the script, then you have to make it, and then you have to, uh, to some extent, cast yourself. So is it uh, is it difficult? To, uh, what are the, what do you go through, and what were you what were you looking for in yourself in finding your younger counterpart? Well, it's always to do with the spirit of the characters. Yeah, it's like when I asked, when I asked. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, when I when I asked Sinead Cusack to play the mother, my mother, <clears throat> and she said, um, uh, "Did I want? Did I want her to do an impersonation of Sarah Miles, who played part in the Hope and Glory?" And I said, "No, you know, I'm not casting you on the way you appear. I think I'm casting you because of your, you have the." the spirit that my mother has, and so did Sarah Miles. So it, it's the, it was the essence, the spirit of the characters that I was always looking for. Because only, um, only, or... only a few years had passed in the film, but uh, sort of 27, 28 years had passed in, in real life, so there was recasting. But you still had uh, David Heyman. This it may be him now. Uh, but the father repeated the role, didn't he? So uh, was that an interesting conversation to have? <laughs> Hello. I'll, I'll call you back. I'm just in the middle of a Q&A. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah. um, so, so uh, David Heyman re revised his role yeah. as as, as uh, the father. Yes. Was that uh, was he surprised to uh, to get that? Well, call? he was really too old for it, but we uh, you know, fixed him up, and there's quite a bit you can do with uh, pulling the skin back, you know, like this, and, you know, with a sellotape and pulling it back, and gave him a wig, and, yeah. but he, he was such a great spirit, and I always, I, I really wanted him to have him in the film, yeah. yeah. Is it, I mean, obviously having such an in incredible and interesting career over so many years, like, is it interesting working with actors over such a long period of time, like, uh, you know, John Voigt you worked with on Deliverance, yeah. and then 20 years later on The General, is yes. that, do you find that you kind of pick up where you left off, or do you find is it how does it feel to work with people for that long? 
Well, it's, it's, a, it, it's always a very intensive uh, re relationship between an actor and a director, you know, yeah. a leading actor. And, um, you know, it, it's, if, if, you've, if you've done a film together like Deliverance right, with John Voight, you know, it's a, it, it creates a bond between you. It's like being, you've been to war together, you know, yeah. you've survived. So it's, you know, I've... John became a great friend. We have been friends ever since, and he, and he's a, a great actor. And he came to Ireland <clears throat> to do the general, and he played um, an Irish police inspector. And I introduced him to this police inspector, an Irish police. And it was like the invasion of the body snatchers. He he took not only the man's voice and gestures and the way of walking and talking, but he he, he just. Um, just absolutely absorbed this this character, and this this guy could hardly believe this mirror image of himself he was seeing in front of him. You know, it was yeah. his man. So yes, it, it's and I you know I really um, I'm I love actors, and I'm also always grateful that there there are people who are prepared to stand up in front of a camera and uh, yeah. and uh, simulate emotions um, and convincingly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they they need a lot of protection, right? I mean, because I mean, there, I think that there's filmmakers in the audience. Uh, yeah. Are you a filmmaker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very shy filmmakers. One filmmaker. So for this guy, um, are there are there any um, what you know when you when you if you're advising filmmakers um, and working with actors and, and yeah, what would what would be your your tips to them? Well, with actors, the. You know, there are two kinds of acting, what I call um, uh, daring acting and, and, and defensive acting. If an actor feels, um, doesn't feel secure in a situation or in a scene, he'll fall back on de defensive acting. He, 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 he'll say, oh, I know how to get through this without making a fool of myself. Whereas, if an actor feels secure and is well trained into the into the scene, then and feels uh, that you're looking after him or her, then they will, you know, take chances because that's really what you're trying to get them to, you know, go a little bit further, go take risks, see if something marvelous might come out, and that takes a lot of courage. Right, so a kind of a safe environment for them. So. But I think, I think it's, um, you know, I, I've often been asked, I, I, I've, made, I've made films with a lot of difficult, so-called difficult actors, and, and I'm often asked, you know, who's the most difficult actor you work with? And I've never worked with a difficult actor. I have never had any, any serious difficulties with actors because um, once you, you work things out and talk things out and what you're doing, it's, 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 it's always a very uh, positive thing. And I think actors only usually make trouble or difficulties when they're, when they're angry or insecure, worried. So, no, I think actors are great. Yeah, they're pretty good. Um, and we were talking earlier as well that um, this this film was shot digitally, and you're you're very passionate about shooting <coughs> digitally now. Is that when did you sort of make the switch, and when when were you persuaded? Well, I've always been very quite technical, and. Uh, I, I, you know, film is a 19th century invention, um, and uh, it's been, it's had all sorts of problems, and difficulties. It's uh, if particularly a color film is oversaturated. Eastman Kodak is oversaturated. It's very difficult to do anything about it, and um, I couldn't wait for digital. Um, I think it's great. Um, I, don't you think it's marvelous when you go to the cinema these days and you watch a film that doesn't have any dirt or scratches in it? It's fantastic. Um, and then 
some of my friends, like Joel Cohen and, for instance, uh, they hang on to the film, and they're hanging on to something. And I would say, look, it's actually, the film has been down, going downhill since the very beginning. We started out with silver nitrate, flammable film, which was absolutely ex beautiful with these, these velvety blacks and lovely color, the silver screen. And then, but it, of course, was very dangerous and caught fire, and it was very hard to put it out because as it burns, it produces it ox its own oxygen. So we made safety film, and that took the, 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 the gloss off black and white. It was never quite the same as it was. And then they introduced color, and it, it vulgarized film, uh, because the, the object was to try to make it closer to life, whereas film is not life, film is metaphor. So the idea of trying to achieve reality is futile. Uh, you know, film is a, a contiguous world, not the well, our world. It's a, a one that run, runs alongside our world. So, so, so color. I thought I think went down with color, and then um, so. When, when digital came along, we had, suddenly we had utter control over the image. We could make the, we could, uh, make the color exactly as we wanted it to be. We could, we could uh, add shadow. We could, for instance, the, you know, for instance, one of the, one of the problems with film was if you've got two characters, one with a very pale face and one with a very dark face, and they're moving around this, the scene, it's almost impossible to light, because one is either going to be overexposed or the other one's going to be underexposed. And uh, Philip Rousselot um, developed a very complex system with Chinese lanterns on poles and the electricians moving them, moving them around the set. And he, he had a, a, a panel of faders and he could fade them in and out. Incredibly elaborate. And with digital grading, you don't need to bother with it with that. If, you, you, if you've got one pale face, you can put a, an oval across the face and you can bring that light up a little bit or take it down a little bit. So you can do all these lighting adjustments in, in, in the grading. And, and, you know, night shooting. The number of nights I've spent in my life uh, where you, you put a brute up on a, on a cherry picker and, and to make a backlight like moonlight, and that comes up. And once you've got that, you can't do it until it's got dark. You can't prepare it until it gets dark. Now, now you get flares everywhere, and you spend the first two hours putting flags up to eradicate the flowers, so the, flare, the flares. Now, now we just we don't bother with the flares. We just when we when we're grading, we just paint them out. It's it's become a much more um, fine-tuned art form than it was with film. I also like that that sentence began with um, some of my friends like Joel Cohen. That's a really nice thing to be able to say. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, do, I mean, do you enjoy, are you, are you very collegial with other directors? Do you enjoy kind of talking about filmmaking and comparing notes or? Oh yes, I do. And in fact, you know, I did for a long time, I, I uh, co-edited this series of books called Projections for Faber and Faber. Uh, we did one a year for 13 years, uh, Walter Donia and I, and that was about the that was all about the process of making films. And I got directors and art directors and cameramen to contribute to this. Um, and uh, no, I, I love uh, the, the conversations uh, very much. Yeah, and I'm in touch with uh, quite a number of uh, directors that. Uh, that we meet regularly and talk about it all. Hmm. 
We were talking earlier. You, I mean, about you have you have final cut on your films, but um, do you do you still have um, a, a sort of valued sounding boards? Who is who would who would be the first person you'd ask for advice on a script or a, a cut? Is there anyone that is consistently uh, good? Well. This uh, Walter Donahue I, t I spoke about, who we, we edited these books together. I always show him the first draft, right. and he has um, a very good eye. Um, but you have to stay away from these script gurus, right? I will, um, because the, you know they talk about you know the script should be in three acts. And I say, well, you know, when did you last see a play in three acts? You know, it's ridiculous. And they, that, it's because of them that there are so many American films look so predictable. Um, and, and consequently, the audience become accustomed to these certain patterns. And if they, they get uncomfortable when those patterns uh, don't occur, uh, you know, and so that What's happened in America, really, is that originality becomes the enemy. Uh, because I, I remember once pitching a story to a, st a Hollywood studio, and the head of the studio said to me, well, what's the 30-second TV ad? And I, of course, I couldn't come up with it. So he said, well, you know, if, if you can't express it in 30 seconds, we shouldn't make it, because that's how we sell the films. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, you know, I get it, really. And it, you know, you, you have a movie star holding a gun, and you've got it, you know. And whereas if it's any degree of complexity, you just cannot express it in that, in that way. So it's, um, it's, it's funneling all films and ideas through this tiny little hole. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I've been uh, hugging the attention. I'm sure there are questions from the audience. So does anyone have this question over there? Just, uh, there are roving mics as well, so do Thank hang you. on just when you get it. Um, I found it very interesting what you said about actors needing uh, protection. Yeah. Because I'm an actor. But I also liked what you said about um, just the fact that you've always been quite technical. And I've found that the more I've done acting work, the more I've realized how much acting is just another department along with everything else. Camera needs to be ready, sound needs to be ready, lights need to be ready. Mm. And there's the book by David Edgar, How Plays Work, that talks nicely about how drama's sort of, um, it's an art form where the material you use isn't paint or stone or ink, it's a pulse or a spirit, the dramatic impulse that goes through the story and I think if ever I felt like I could have stabbed my foot and had a hissy fit it was because you felt all of the technical departments the electronic and mechanical departments were ready and then because we're up against the time performance please and you think the mood in the room and the, the, the vibe in the room, I think, is very important for actors. But do you agree with that, or is that just me being precious, do you think? <laughs> um, well, I think that <clears throat> it's one, of the, one of the difficulties of film acting is that, uh, by, by the very nature of it, it's stopping and starting. And you can be called, and you can be s sitting around for two or three hours before you get to shoot and and you can get a loss of energy it's very hard as an actor to to keep up your energy level when you're waiting around and that's particularly true with <clears throat> films that are you know a lot of special effects and things where the actors are waiting and waiting and waiting and you get this drop of energy and it's it's up to directors got to keep that up but but it's very hard and and i've seen actors um you know chatting and chatting and talking uh, and and uh, and use up their energy instead of conserving it and um you have to find your own way of doing that of it, it, it's it's difficult. It's it really it's very difficult. But um, um, everything everything on a film for me on a film everything is focused on the actor. He or she has to do it, and um, everybody 
on the set should be there helping them to bring it off. Okay, uh, that's very useful, thank you. Turn it back there. Can I just challenge your comment about the screen gurus? I attended Robert McKee's um, screenwriting course by accident um, 25 years ago. And um, I've read his book, Story, and I think he's one of the people you have in mind. And I think in your autobiography, you mention him as well. What he is saying, if you're right, his advice is being misused. His point is that, as with Picasso, could you know, was a perfect draftsman and then broke all of the rules. His point is that you have to understand the classic way of writing a story and then if you want to break the rules, he would encourage you to do that. And he has many discussions of that in his book and in his course. So I do think you're being a bit glib and a bit unfair when you make that criticism. That was a question from Robert McKean, just about that. <laughs> well, what, what, what are these rules? You know, they're, they're, imp they're imposed. I, I don't know what these rules are. Um, I think, you know, it's... You take your story or the idea and you develop it. I, I don't know. I'm never very conscious of ideas, of, of rules. Um, at all. I don't think you should be. I think you should just um, just express your story in, in images and in the best way you can. Um, a question there, sorry. Um, you've got such a wide variety in your back catalogue of the types of films you've made. Um, the first part of my question is, what is it in particular that you look for in a project? What attracts you to a project? And secondly, one of my favourite films of all time, Deliverance. Um, was that a particularly difficult film to make, given the subject matter, the location, etc.? I mean, could you expand a bit on that as well? So it's like a two-part question. Well, I, I, what I, I mean, I think, like most directors, I've probably spent more time on films I haven't made than the ones I have made. You know, projects fall apart, fall apart, fall down for one reason or another. You can't cast it, or you can't get the script right, or there are many, many reasons, or you can't get the money. Well, very, that's very likely. Um, so, I, generally speaking, you know, I start with an idea or a, a, an idea or a subject, and, and I develop it. And if it continues to hold my attention and, and my uh, interest, I keep going, and if, if I lose interest, I, don't, I drop it. So it comes from you, first, yes. rather than people sending you scripts? Or yeah, largely, yeah. Okay. yeah. Whereas, of course, Deliverance came as a novel by J James Dickey, a poet, and uh, um, that was, well, it was, it was, it was, it was physically a difficult film to make because we were on this river and um, I was very fortunate to end. I started with four actors, and I was very happy to end with four actors. Um, but, it was that potentially dangerous making it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, someone asked me the other day, which of which of my films would I not have been able to make under the present rules of uh, of health and safety? <laughs> nowadays, we have to have a health and safety officer on the film, and he he assesses the risks of each scene. And if he feels the risks are excessive, you have to change the scene or do it in a different way or something like that, you know, and um, so, well, when I considered it, there, there were probably about four or five of my films I would not have been able to make. Um, the but, I, but, you know, uh, and, but I, I never use stuntmen because I always feel that if you're doing a scene that requires a stuntman, you're, you're saying it's dangerous. And I don't think you should do a dangerous scenes. I think, you know, I always find a way of doing it that um, 
eliminates the danger. You know, there's lots of things you can do to make it exciting without throwing stuntmen off a cliff or something. So when I four guys in white water rafting in the film. Yeah, well, yes, but, you know, water is very forgiving. <laughs> uh, gentleman there in the, uh, with a hat, just in the back, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm an actor from Germany, from Hamburg. Uh, we have a film tomorrow. Uh, it was a wonderful film. I liked it very, very much. Personal film, but also history of uh, England. Thank you very much for the film, but I have four questions, uh, very short questions. How much was the budget of the film? How many days did you shoot? And before you... Uh, uh, started to shoot uh, days before or weeks before. Did you rehearse with the actors? Uh, and the last question, I know what happened to you. You are a great filmmaker, great director. What happened, uh, uh, what happened to uh, Ophelia? Is, is she living now or uh, where is she? <laughs> Which one? Should we go with, so uh, yeah. what was the budget? So, well, well, vielen Dank für Ihre Frage. Uh, uh, ja, also Sie sprechen Deutsch, wunderbar. <laughs> so, well, I, I, I shot three days on the River Thames at Shepparton and five weeks in Romania. And the budget was just under four million euro. Okay. And did you rehearse? Did you rehearse? with the actors. I did, yes, always rehearse with the actors, yeah, because I think the, the I don't rehearse, I don't block the scenes out or anything, but I just talk about each scene, what we're aiming at, what we're trying to do, and the, the, and, and the, you know, the shape of it. And because the, the worst thing you can have is you go on the set and the actor has misunderstood the scene and you, you're in a mess. You've got to iron all that out beforehand and, you know, develop the characters. You know, everything is cheaper than shooting. And the longer you can um, prepare, uh, the better it is. Um, preparation is everything. And, and where is Ophelia? Where is Ophelia? Ophelia, well... I lost touch with her. She was, you know, when she had uh, uh, the second nervous breakdown, um, I never saw her again. Um, but the other one, yeah, I married her, actually. <laughs> Uh, I think Graham here has a question. Yeah. This is Graham. He's very nice. Hey, Tom Betts. Thanks for that. Uh, I would just like um, to say, first thing is Zardos is one of my favourite cult classic films. Absolutely love that film. Uh, great to see Sean Connery uh, just doing what he does on film. <laughs> <laughs> and with what he was wearing. Uh, uh, but my question is to do with when you were talking about imagination and memory and things like that, um, that first scene where you see Ophelia and she turns and it's this sort of moment of magical realism, is that sort of more the truth for you now looking back rather than what, what actually happened? Well, it's very difficult to know because when I was making Hope and Glory, I reproduced the living room of our house and my mother and her three sisters came to the set to look at it, and they were amazed at how accurate it was. And one of the things I did was, I'm going through old um, wallpaper samples, and I found the, the wallpaper that was on the walls of the, of the room. And being, I was very self-indulgent. I tracked down, it was no longer made, I tracked down the blocks the original blocks and had it made up at great expense, put it on the wall. And what, one of my others, they said, well, you have, it's just, just astonishing that you've reproduced every detail. What a pity you got the wallpaper wrong. <laughs> so you never know why, you know, memory is very treacherous. Um, as, as to Zardos, 
Um, well, it's uh, Fox phoned me just a few weeks ago and said they were restoring it. And I said, why? <laughs> they said, well, there's a lot of, a lot of interest in this film. You know, we're going to, going to bring out a, uh, a new Blu-ray, and, and I worked with them on the colors and everything. Um, but it seems that it's a film that went from being a failure to a classic without ever passing through success. <laughs> And uh, I think we've got room for one more question, and this gentleman here, he's a filmmaker, so... Okay. Well, I'm actually not going to ask a film-related question. Did you stay friends with Percy? Well... The, the, the it, love story in the film. Yeah, yeah. Well, Percy... You know, in fact, he was as mad as a hatter, really, because he... Uh, in the film, I show the, 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 the whole thing with the clock, which he succeeded in bringing this whole camp to a standstill. Well, in fact, he did it four times. Every two weeks, <laughs> he, got, he stole something else and shipped it out through the camp post office. And every two weeks, the whole camp was brought to a standstill. He absolutely succeeded in wrecking the whole, the whole camp. You know, he, he succeeded where the... Where the, the Nazi <laughs> failed. <laughs> and I lost touch with him, I have to say. I lost touch with him. And, um, did, he, did he come back and find your sister? He did, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. That, that, he, he did, indeed. And he lived with her for a while um, until she moved on. <laughs> um, and uh, in the end, finally, my sister, she married. She, she married this guy who was 15 years younger than her. And um, in all her adventures, uh, this was the most bizarre. Um, and they were together for 30 years and were devoted. And he, when she died, he, he was uh, so distraught. He, he, he became a kind of uh, recluse. So there was a happy ending to that story. <laughs> and um, speaking of endings, so this film ends on a quite a, it's a romantic but kind of a haunting image as well. It's the film camera and the film camera stops. Well, so what can we take from that? Well, that was my way of saying that this is my last film. Right. Um, and uh, the camera stops, so you know, it has to stop at some point. Um, I'm 82. Um, and, uh, you know, it was always, uh, my hero was always um, Manuel D'Olivero, the Portuguese director who just died at 106. <laughs> and he made his last film at 105. <laughs> uh, yeah. Alan Rene made a film at 91. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm running out of steam, I can't keep going. I, I, I'm being encouraged to make one more film, which I, I might do if I can find the money and the energy. Right. Well, these guys are loaded, so I'm sure <laughs> they'll, they'll help you out. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but we're very, very grateful that you've been here, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you.